Good morning, everyone. I apologize for the delay. Um, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Sahar Shirazi. I am a principal and um, co-lead of our emerging mobility sector at Nelson Nygaard in uh, Oakland, California. We are an outcome-based uh, planning and policy firm that works all over the country and a little bit internationally to try and help folks um, in cities and, and regions around the world uh, reach better outcomes using innovation and technology and uh, standard practices. So really excited to be here, really excited to be part of this crew. Um, and again, I apologize for missing the beginning, but have we done an introduction of the session at all? Uh, no. no. Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone to our session, uh, Disruptive New Mobility Innovations. And today we're gonna talk a little bit about the, the different innovations and disruptions that we're constantly bombarded with uh, in recent years through our lives. Um, and that we haven't quite figured out how to deal with yet in terms of both on the individual and the social and political level. Um, governments often want to know what these innovations are and why they are beneficial to society, uh, but the industry it, it, it thrives on the fundamental human needs. So in this session, we're going to discuss what makes innovations disruptive, uh, how the social impact of such disruptive innovations can be assessed, and that's thinking about things such as sustainability and equity um, as we look at the outcomes of such disruptions, and finally, how policymakers should navigate through disruptions to regulate these innovations and facilitate both the transition period and the outcomes for society. We have a really exciting uh, list of guest speakers with us today who are going to discuss some of these um, concepts as well as some particular uh, disruptive innovations um, that have come out in the last decade or so. So I'll start just by introducing our guests who can introduce themselves a little bit more uh, as we get into their sessions. But um, first, we have Sri, who is an expert in the field of innovations and mobility. He has a master's degree in transport infrastructure logistics from the Technical University of Delft and has a background in civil engineering and geosciences. Um, Sri has worked as a business developer at Virgin Hyperloop which we will also talk a little bit about today. Uh, currently, sorry, one moment. Sri works at as a mobility consultant at TNO, and his main area of expertise is disruptive innovations in mobility. He explores and assesses the impact of technologies and mobility concepts that are efficient, can reduce or even replace travel, providing alternative routes towards, towards achieving climate goals. I'm really excited to hear uh, about Sri's presentation today. Um, but let me go ahead and introduce everyone else before we jump right in. Uh, we also have with us Yasher, who studied engineering and policy analysis at the Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands for his master's degree. He then continued on the topic of transport policy, modeling and economic Econo econometrics <laughs> for his PhD at the same university. I do apologize, guys, it is five in the morning here, so I'm a little slow with words sometimes today. <laughs> Uh, he investigated passenger preferences regarding sustainable mobility policies and applied statistical and economic econometric methods to understand the impact of different environmental policies on people's choice of transport. After his PhD, Yasher Yasha has been working in the transport sector as a researcher and project manager with a focus on sustainability, data-driven policy analysis, and innovation management in transport. So we're really excited to have Yasha with us today as well. And finally, we have Lucien. Thank you, Yasha. Um, finally, we have Lucien, who is a European thematic leader in sustainable cities and buildings with EIT uh, Eno Energy. Throughout her career, Lucienne has developed and managed innovative products, systems, strategies, and businesses, mainly related to energy and always in an international uh, setting. She has a background in chemical and mechanical engineering, and she'll be talking a little bit to us today about Hyperloop technology. So without further ado, I would like to pass it over to our first speaker, Sri, to, to start, um, start us off today. Sorry, can everyone hear? 
three. I think now it should be okay. Yep. Do you hear me? Thank you. Yes. Um, good morning, Sahar, and thanks very much for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody from the other side of the world um, um, as well. Great that we have a lot of guests here. Uh, without any delay, I'm going to get started on my presentation as well. So, um, today I'll be going to be talking about uh, disruptive innovations, um, example of the technology social extended reality. A bit about myself, um, which of course Sahar gave a very nice introduction. Um, um, I'm Sri, I really work uh, on uh, with the focus on disruptive mobility concepts. I have background in transport, but would like to look into how innovations can affect mobility and how that scenario and the future scenarios and how can we prepare the governments and the companies around this arena. About uh, um, uh, the company where I work at, uh, TNO is a Dutch research organization. It is an independent organization and it was founded in 1932 by law. Um, I work in the traffic and transport unit, uh, one of the many that you see here. Uh, of course, there are research happening in many other sectors as well. Um, and we are uh, in a lot of places in the Netherlands and I'm situated in Den Haag, uh, The Hague. Um, apart from national, we also have an international presence, uh, right from Japan to Singapore, Malaysia, Brussels, as well as Canada and the United States of America. So let's get on to the problem. We have seen these kind of pictures quite a lot. Cities with a lot of an exception to last year, of course. Also very dense cities which consume more resources than ever before. Housing prices go up and the conditions to live um, are maybe total. However, the development was big. We wanted a better quality of life. But are we getting that now? That's, that's still a question because on the other side, if we look closely, this is what's happening. We need to be very aware, very much aware of our own actions and the consequences that it causes. But on the other side to the some opportunities, there are innovations, especially if you look into the mobility sector, which causes 30% of the overall uh, uh, emissions. In the last 10 years, there's been rise of many companies, um, uh, right from uh, low cost airlines to micro modalities, as well as new model, new completely new mode of transport, which can revolutionize the way how we travel, like for instance the hybrid. The issue with this is that sometimes these innovations can be quite uncertain with their disruptive potential. So, what sort of impact can it cause on the economy, but also on the society? And what we have seen from past, especially in the last ten years, is that such innovations are and can be disruptive so we can't uh, uh, just forget about them and to be able to be aware and predict what the uncertainty is about and how we can uh, deal with them more effectively and make sure that these innovations actually contribute to the challenges that we are facing we shouldn't only look into the mobility side but also the innovations happening outside the mobility so for instance you might have variables uh, the starlings uh, uh, that are supposed to uh, provide internet throughout the globe, chips, semiconductors, how that affects even the production of Teslas today, as well as uh, going ahead into AI. Can we be uh, a, a virtually, can, can there be ourselves? And all of these innovations have an effect on mobility. To understand it better, to give it a bit more structure, Maybe it's easier to explain it this way. On the right hand side, you see three circles. There are basically three levels. The first level is innovations that happen directly in mobility. So these are, for example, uh, carpooling, car sharing, new modes like Hyperloop, uh, step scooters, uh, automated driving, self-driving cars, 
and taxis and even who knows hypersonic travel. The second layer of innovations are cross-technology innovations. So these are usually enablers that help in one way or the other changing a current mode. So for instance, the availability of 5G network, availability of internet and tracking systems like GPS, uh, but also What about the business models? And what about the new trends where you pay per use instead of paying for ownership? And on the third level, you see uh, there are completely indirect actions uh, are totally irrelevant to the mobility to the mobility sector. So for a topics represents the effect of efficiency of the materials that we use. Uh, Edge computing power. While all these innovations happen in different layers, um, we should also be keep our foot firm on the ground because we also have quite some learnings that we have understood from the past. For example, the mobility constraints. We know that we prefer to travel about 45 minutes a day, not more, not less, by preference. And we know that we don't like congestion and that we don't like waiting time, no matter what whether it be for train or plane or even for your friend who's who's uh, uh, late for a party there are also external constraints you know uh, we, we are doing this entire conference virtually could have been physically but there is also the entire aspect of economy uh, the weather as well as the environment so this is actually good to form an equation there are not only opportunities on one side, but also some constraints which help us to guide towards addressing those innovations. Now, what is the disruptive behavior of these innovations? Why is it important? The entire idea is that way before, letters were the most common base of communication. And then all of a sudden, the facts came into play. That was a huge revolution. Um, the post companies, some even uh, ceased to exist, uh, and they lost out to, for example, Xerox, who invented the fax. A couple of years later, those who did not believe that uh, this is going to be a disruption, they fell away even more being digital. And there was the rise of emails. And further now, businesses are. So, you see how if we don't keep track of disruptions, how much it can change and the effect it has on the governments with respect to policy, especially if they are incumbents, uh, for whom it's a bit difficult to be agile in changing their strategies, it can leave them caught out. And that is exactly what we want to understand. How does it change? Why does it change? And does innovation have these disruptive characteristics so that we have to be aware of them um, so that we can actually track their impacts and advise companies as well as governments to make sure that we not only are aware of them and prepared for them, also we can steer them towards the sustainable goals. So one example of innovation, extended reality. Extended reality is a that you use it's an it's an overarching term that you can use for virtual reality uh, for augmented reality a, a classic example is for example pokemon go maybe we are a bit too old for that but still it's a very nice example and mixed reality which is a combination of both now uh, nevertheless all these technologies we have at least heard about it once and uh, the the entire uh, uh, why it is cool is because it gives a sense of immersiveness. It completely binds our eyes and it feels as if we are in a virtual environment. We might have come across these videos where uh, people have to walk on a straight line, but in the virtual environment, it feels like they have to uh, jump or walk across a, a skyscraper. And you see how the mind gets manipulated because they feel as if they lose their balance. So that's basically the immersive aspect of such technologies. Now, at TNO, we know this technology has some potential, 
But what is more unique is the societal aspects, the social aspect of this collaboration. Now, that opens up the world to a completely new type of experience. Because with the same technology, um, you would feel as if all of us are actually seated in a conference room and are actually having a face-to-face -face, uh, uh, presentation. And that is possible through social extra. So it's not just one person's view to the virtual environment, but it's a virtual environment with many people in there together. And although in the first couple of minutes, it might indeed seem like, well, this is virtual, but it is. it can become so convincing that people can forget that it's virtual and actually the effectiveness of the entire meeting can now um well we've been experimenting for the last one and a half years about it uh we've looked into some uh uh, uh, uh developments also out for example this picture uh in the left bottom corner is from facebook uh which exists even virtual reality platform uh, where avatars are used as uh, uh, people uh, to discuss about anything but in a social aspect. Um, the meeting room above on the left top corner is what we've uh, tried to build at TNO as a part of one of our research projects. What we want is to go towards the picture at the right where we are not we, we get rid of avatars but we actually want to see people. We want to have the connection. We want to see eye to eye. Now, where are we in reality? The, the right hand side top corner picture is the first error attempt we had about two years ago to try if this can work or not. Well, I should say, well, the quality is horrible, but the, the participants in the room already got a feeling of, hey, well, we are actually, it feels like we are together. And that feeling, is what we've been looking for. And below, uh, another classic example where uh, the, the colleague on the left hand side um, is actually in one of our offices in The Hague, but the colleague on the right hand side of the table is actually from a different city, from Groningen, which is about, um, I think, 100 kilometers away or something from The Hague, or even more than that. So that already shows how you can bring how you can a business. Um, there is a short video uh, that I would like to show to understand what this system is about. Sri, we cannot hear the sound of the video. Is there with the sound? Is everybody able to hear the sound? No, we don't hear the sound. But you have to click okay. uh, when sharing your screen. You have to click on the box share audio. So you share your screen and click share audio in the box. Maybe a second try now. No, we still don't hear it's the sound. Like... Did you share the audio? Yeah. Can you maybe send me the link and I will share for you? Nevertheless, uh, maybe we can play this with panel discussion as well. I would like to continue with the presentation because the flow is more important. Now, um, with regards to this particular technology, what are we doing in, um, how is it connected with mobility? Now, there are three flagship use cases. One is the uh, business meetings or even, for example, leisure meetings. Um, how can we effectively meet at remote? 
The second is XR. How can we enable remote visits to, for example, uh, nursing homes with with the communication devices that we have today? So it doesn't mean that we need to have very great uh, specific devices that are that are required. And it is about how can we transfer our skills to environments where there is always a shortage of labor. So, for example. Um, uh, in the medical scenario, where there is a shortage of nurse, for example, there are shortage of offshore wind farms, for instance. There are just certain necessary skills required for a particular uh, operation and uh, uh, to, to make sure that the operation is done effectively and efficiently, uh, additional skills can be brought remotely uh, at that particular place. Now, Let's go a bit deeper into the mobility side. How can there be societal impact through social extended reality? Imagine if you if you look for uh, uh, the, the Google Maps to reach a place, and this is the result that you got. Of course, the address is in uh, San Francisco, so probably the address is a bit unrecognizable. But you have to, takes you about two hours. And there is an option which takes you five minutes. And all you have to do is bike to the nearest VR cafe to be at the meeting. And what will it mean to the entire mobility scenario? So what we would be seeing is a sort of digital model shift. An experience where, for example, instead of air miles, you would be spending internet miles. So when that happens, then the entire, the number of trips that we are traveling could be replaced by digital um, but not only that it could also induce more trips we do not know because we know what we know is that only 15 percent of the entire population on earth travels more than 100 kilometers um, let's say for a particular activity like holidays the rest of the 85 percent is still untouched and if everybody wants to travel is that a good decision for us or not so these are things that we have to keep in mind even before we tackle such a kind of innovation. What is important to understand is the, the human factors about the acceptance, about the immersiveness and the environment, but also about enhancing the connectivity and togetherness um, for the acceptance of this uh, technology as a modality, as an alternative. You already see there are quite some uh, uh, results, uh, research papers published, uh, especially this year. So last year uh, is when the extra technology was really on, on its helm uh, because of the uh, pandemic, of course. Um, and now it is becoming more and more active and there is a lot more developments going on on the industry side. So what is this digital model shift? What does it mean? What is the first sort of impacts we can expect? Everything except one. For the companies, the travel budgets, they actually see how much they can save if people don't travel. And for bigger the company, the more international, the more they actually see in their bank account. And it's not a small amount of money, uh, definitely in millions. So clearly, if we choose a digital alternative to a physical uh, a current uh, option, it's going to save time. It's going to save money as well as CO2. There is one for every stakeholder, for the business, for the employer, employee, as well as for the government. What it contributes to is also towards zero, zero loss in terms of efficiency and zero casualties. So that's a step going towards the societal goals. Now, let's put it in a transport equation. Usually we compare uh, in, in the transport domain, those who, are, those who know about this pretty well, um, you take an example, you look into Amsterdam, Paris. Now, how is this gonna look like? For the sake of disruptiveness, let's compare with Hyperloop and with social extended reality. The journey time, well, this is, uh, we need to be careful. It's end to end. It's not about the first mile and last mile. It's, it's just about, the, the, the moment that you're in the vehicle and the vehicle starts. Um, right now, it takes about three hours, 20 minutes in Dallas. It takes about, it would take about 30 minutes in Hyperloop. 
because it doesn't exist yet. Um, and it might take less than five minutes to get used to and adjusted with the headset. Um, the travel cost, although it's reimbursable by business, um, it starts for the train for Talis. It starts from five euros for Hyperloop, probably around 90 euros, I think. I'm not sure. Nobody's sure about it yet. Um, and assuming that the adoption is going to be quite low in the beginning and it's going to be sort of a PS uh, use service, maybe around 10 to 20 euros, depending on what kind of service you choose for, from premium to standard. The comfort of the journey, well, uh, both Hyperloop as well as uh, the, the train, there is some sort of transfer uh, because uh, they connect the main uh, network and of course the first mile and last mile has to be covered. Um, however, for extended reality, it is probably it is the same situation, but it's more dependent on the quality of the experience, the quality of the connection. But there are also some factors which needs to be considered because in the regular transport equation all that matters right now is time cost and comfort everything is put into these three factors and there's of course one coefficient where all the other extras go into but what we have learned is that coefficient where all the other factors go into is may not be always representative especially in kinds of new innovations so for example what are the externalities for example, the use of government subsidies, which modes use as subsidies. Um, what about the flexibility of using such a service? Uh, because yeah, both of the, especially the train runs on timetable. The Hyperloop runs more or less on an on-demand on-demand transport, so there is a bit of flexibility. Um, with social XR, well, it's just like this right now. With the disutilities, for example, transfers delays, waiting times, people don't like it. And the same for Hyperloop. Uh, for extended reality, well, there is also a very uh, important disutility. It's the internet connection. If it is slow, people also don't like it. Um, important thing is the utility function, which defines how you can integrate a particular technology or modality into the transport equation to first of all understand what sort of effect it can have over the other modes. For a train, well, we know what the utility functions are, and we know how to derive it as well. For Hyperloop, well, there is a methodology, but we don't know it yet. For extended reality, it's a completely different mode. It has totally different characteristics. We don't know what we don't know what the methodology is either. So that makes it interesting, but also raises a lot of questions because. Whether we believe it or not, the big the big uh, companies they are coming by late this year or even next year. Uh, there are going to be augmented reality glasses that you can buy together with your iPhone, for example. It's true, and as well as for Facebook, if this is how the future may look like, and even if it contributes to only 3% of the entire model split that happens today, still the impact can be significant. It can be a decision factor if there will be a congestion in a particular motorway on a particular day or not. So the question still remains, how do you steer such innovations to achieve maximum societal impact? So for this, it is necessary to understand the impact of technology on choice behavior, on acceptance, and especially how it fits with our current human uh, needs. Secondly, it is also important to understand the scenarios on the environment and the economy, also the indirect effects. And thirdly, the governance models. How can we steer them positively towards the societal impact? And this is something which we are working on, which um, uh, my the colleague uh, uh, who will be presenting next will share a bit more information about. Thank you. I believe the questions are at the end. Yes, I think so. Um, shall I start uh, presenting mine uh, presentation? Yeah, perhaps that's, that's a good idea. Yeah. 
Sorry. Yes, please. Yes, please. Sorry. I, I could. Um, I was just trying to get back on. We're going to take all the questions at the end. I have been adding them to our list as they come in. So thank you. Please keep putting them in the question and answer box and we'll make sure to get us to as many as we can. Um, thank you, Sri. That was that was a great presentation. I, I'm really excited to ask some questions uh, as we move forward. Um, but let's move on and let uh, Yasher present as well. Thank you, Yasher. Uh, you're welcome. Um... I'll just share my screen. Do you see my screen now? Yes. Uh, very uh, good. Uh, good evening, good morning to those uh, other side of the ocean. Um, uh, my name is Yashar Aragi. I work at the the colleague, a colleague of uh, Sri just presented. Um, uh, he was looking at one of the, um, in the interesting uh, uh, disruptive innovations in, in in technology which will probably heavily affect the transport sector uh, i want to present to you a, a bit more theory and methodology and that is uh, discussed in the transport uh, disruptive uh, innovation theory uh, how do you say uh, literature in the transport? Um, I'll try to not not make it so boring as it sounds, but um, I'll try to say give you some of the new frontiers that we have been working in. Um, but just to give you a flavor of what the literature says about disruptive innovations, they are not breakthrough technologies um, that make a, a, a good product better. And these are this is normally called uh, incremental innovations. The disruptive innovations are actually the innovations that change the pathways of the current innovations. They require a, a lot of research and development. They require new modes of production, new markets. They can even transform and displace the current uh, incumbent companies or uh, firms that are um, that are innovating in a specific sector. Um, to give you an example of uh, disruptive innovations that in the, from the literature that they give a famous example about the music industry, uh, there are three type of uh, disruptive uh, innovations that can happen in a uh, industry. It can um, it can uh, be at a segment of the industry, let's say when the players arrived and it uh, completely um, put away uh, cassettes and uh, CDs. And uh, when they um, uh, that affected one part of the uh, segment in the music industry, and uh, later on uh, when the we saw that the industry structure started to change, so the music companies instead of distributing the CDs and the digital uh, 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 music, they started owning uh, the uh, musical content, and uh, and uh, in recent years. Some artists actually have put away the whole um, supply chain of the Indian music industry, and they have been starting using their own social network in terms of uh, uh, making the content, distributing, selling it via Spotify, via YouTube, or whatever. So basically, you can see that the disruptive can change in different forms or uh, shapes. Um, uh, I have to warn you as a disclaimer that uh, this. Uh, uh, th that um, uh, th this presentation, this work is more uh, from the uh, uh, market uh, side, mar market induced demand. There are some people that talk about the policy uh, motivated in a disruptive innovation. So policymakers, planners try to uh, uh, help uh, one innovation to disrupt the market but what i am presenting to you is more from the market side uh, so or the demand side so what does disruptive innovation ha mean from the market side in transport um, we look at christiansen's theory a lot of people working with disruption topics uh, they know christiansen as one of the guru gurus of this topic um, he says that a disruption can have, if you look at the graph in the uh, right side of my screen, uh, he says that uh, uh, the, there is normally an incumbent company or a firm that is uh, providing the technology or the new innovation and it always tries to make keep a gap between what customer demand um, demands now and provides a premium that uh, uh, allow that motivates customers to buy their new features and um, 
products. So that is a normal incremental innovation. But when a disruptor arrives to the market, it normally starts from, according to Christiansen, normally starts from the lower end of the market, tries to uh, capture the customers at the, at the lower end or even non-customers that people didn't even want to uh, buy that technology, but now they are looking at it, it becomes cheap and uh, affordable and interesting for them. So they enter the market. And slowly, slowly, they pick up pace uh, uh, and gaining more market sector as, uh, from the incumbent. And the incumbent at the beginning ignores the disruptor. And um, uh, according to Christensen, when this happens and disruptor will uh, just uh, try to get more foothold in the market. And when it arrives to the uh, mainstream demand uh, uh, of the, of the uh, market, then the disruption already has happened. And the incumbent has to actually accept the innovator, the, the disruptive innovator, or to take it over or react to it. Um, or uh, like making a product that, uh, that sounds like the uh, disruptor, uh, the, the same as disruptor. So according to Christiansen, this is how disruption happens uh, from the market side. What it means in uh, transport, for example, if a mode that arrives, uh, let's say Hyperloop or uh, let's say a, a new mode, a flying car, uh, we think, according to Christiansen, three things must be uh, in place for that mode of transport to become um, disruptive. We think that the product should be affordable, so it should be comparable or at lower cost for travel. It must have the easy uh, use feature, so it must be available for people, widely available wherever they live in, and must be comfortable mode. Um, and uh, it must have the basic features. For example, it must be safe, and the travel time should be comparable or lower than what they are used to now. Um, so um, in our study, we looked at the disruptive innovation. We said, we said that we need to first check uh, the existing methodologies to qualify existing innovations as disruption or not. Uh, we looked at different passenger or the freight uh, the modes or technologies that can disrupt the market. And then once we have identified disruptive innovations, we need to go and go ahead and look at the impact uh, assessment area. We need to uh, assess the impact of that innovation. And uh, we think that it would be uh, sensible to uh, diverge a little bit and not look at all the uh, innovations in transport with one eye. So look at the modes and technologies and services with different um, lenses because of the KPIs, key performance indicators of these different uh, modes or technologies or services are quite different from each other. And when we look at the, uh, each of these, uh, we can also look at them uh, from passenger perspective or freight or logistics perspective. So different, for example, different modes that can be, uh, we can think about uh, for uh, tra transport modes for passenger sector, Hyperloop, of course, my colleague just mentioned, flying cars, automated vehicles could be disruptive, potentially disruptive innovations. Uh, for the uh, logistics, uh, autonomous shipping, uh, autonomous trucks could be um, uh, 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 disruptive uh, transport modes. And um, examples, for example, transport services in passenger sector, mobility as a service could be a disruptor. And um, in logistics, uh, many hubs could be uh, um, a disruptor in the services that the logistics sectors can provide in cities and urban areas, which is highly being debated right now with these mini hub areas. Um, and then we uh, discuss about how we can create a framework that that allows us uh, to do the a good or sensible uh, scientific uh, impact assessment. Um, we have come up with this uh, conceptual framework, um, and uh, I will walk you through this uh, framework. Uh, I try to make it fast. Um, once we have uh, in the uh, corner and left corner uh, when we have uh, identified disruptive innovation, uh, whether it is mode, technology or service. Next, we need to, uh, in box number two, we need to identify the functions of that innovations. We need to look at who is going to use it, what is it about, what sort of technology it, uh, it encompasses, uh, what fundamental human needs is going to uh, satisfy or um, uh, provide answers for it, and what kind of business models are, they, are we talking about for that innovation. 
Next, we need to look at the uh, impact areas that uh, need to be assessed for um, a given innovation, a box number three. There, we can uh, either take uh, two methods. Uh, either we look at the uh, method A, uh, where we look at different, um, uh, we do a systematic uh, literature review, uh, and then uh, we, we try to see uh, what mobility aspects, spatial, socioeconomic, well-being aspects are discussed, environmental aspects are being discussed, or if there is not enough enough uh, uh, literature uh, documentation about that uh, um, disruptive innovation because it's so new, it's so uh, innovative, there's nothing in about it, then we have to go to the second method where we advise for a Delphi method, uh, looking at the expert opinion and, and uh, gathering experts' uh, judgment and opinion, opinion on how this innovation is likely going to impact the market. Once we have the impact areas uh, listed, which ones we have to study, we need to come up with research questions. Uh, suitable research question leads us to a suitable hypothesis. And uh, with defining a good set of hypotheses, we can arrive to performance indicators. Performance indicators, I have to um, um, em emphasize that they are the most important part of the impact assessment because they are the, let's say, the first concrete things that you can measure comparing with the incumbent with, with a existing technology, uh, the impact of the disruptive technology. The process of looking at the hypothesis and research questions can be iterative because you might see that these performance indicators are not really measurable or there's not enough data about it. So you need to go back to your research questions and design more suitable research questions. Then um, we need to, uh, after defining our performance indicators, we can uh, look at the, what data exists uh, for, um, this, uh, for this disruptive innovation. If there is no data available, we need to simulate it. We need to see how that innovation compares in the simulation world with the existing modes or technologies uh, and try to uh, get a data or sense of reality from there and then do the analysis, uh, follow, follow up analysis on the data that has been created. We think if this pathway uh, from one to eight uh, can be, if it is uh, uh, followed, then we can have a robust method on doing the impact assessment. And finally, I want to uh, leave you with a list of innova disruptive innovation that was recently discussed, well, in 2019, discussed at the um, ITS World Congress a lot in, in uh, South uh, America. And uh, in the left uh, column, you see a list of technologies and then the, a, a few descriptions about it. But um, to lack of time, I have to end it here. I'll uh, be uh, curious to hear your uh, questions at the end. Thank you, Yasher. Uh, great presentation, lots of detail, um, lots to dig into when we get into our questions. So thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, we have uh, Lucien with an example of a disruptive mobility technology. Lucien? Yes, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I will try to stick within my time as well. Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to talk a bit about uh, disruptive mobility concepts that go beyond going smoothly from point A to B and are actually unlocking the creation of sustainable metro policies. Uh, but before I dive into uh, um, new mobility concepts, just a, a quick recap of the situation today. Um, I think Sri already mentioned several of them. Uh, at this moment, transport is responsible for 30% of GHG emissions. Uh, but at the same time, we need to reduce it. But uh, the demand for passenger and freight transport is still ever increasing. Uh, the forecasted growth uh, amounts to 2.5 times uh, the amount of today in 2050, so just in 30 years. And this would require an infrastructure investment of 69, uh, nine, not, 69 trillion euros. It's a staggering amount of investments, also within the next 30 years. And we already were facing uh, increasing traffic congestion pre-COVID times, and it will get worse. Options to extend the existing infrastructure are diminishing. At the same time, in the cities, there's an increasing urbanization and densification lack of affordable housing, uh, that's the case in the cities here in the Netherlands, 
across Europe, but also in the United States. So it seems to be a global problem at the moment. And there's really a lack of green, healthy environments within cities. The price of the square meter of parks is that high that they are disappearing at this time. So where do we want to end up? Uh, and I picked 2050 because this is an important milestone that Brussels had uh, pinpointed. And they came up with the ambition that Europe needs to be completely decarbonized at that time. So on, in only 30 years, completely decarbonized, the 30% of GHG emissions uh, induced by transport should go down to basically zero. And of course, we want to have a continent that's uh, affordable to live in, accessible, uh, it's healthy, and it's green. So we need also sustainable cities or regions. Uh, travel and transport, modern travel and transport on demand, available and affordable for everyone. And I already mentioned it, the option to live anywhere with acceptable commuting times. So how can we do it? Uh, simply improving the current modes of transport won't do it. Uh, that's too incremental, it goes too slow, and there are limits what can be done. So we need to disrupt the way we travel and transport. And uh, already a lot is mentioned of how we could do it, all kinds of methodologies. Uh, but we picked one, and we wanted to have one that would be faster, greener, better, and smarter. And the one where we ended up with was the Hyperloop. So what is a Hyperloop? Um, it's maybe a new kit on the block. It was first proposed by Elon Musk in 2013. And since then, uh, I have, uh, several companies are developing technology for the Heart Hyperloop, or for the Hyperloop. Heart is one of the companies developing it, both in the United States and in Europe, also some activity in China. And basically what it is, it's aerospace grade vehicles for passengers and high value cargo. And uh, the, the vehicles or the pods, as they call it, are uh, transported in low pressure tubes with effectively zero aerodynamic drag. Uh, the transportation is done by electromagnetic propulsion, levitation, guidance and switching. Very important, fully automated system, real time dynamic IoT control, digital from day one. So you need, don't need to transfer all the infrastructure from an analog system to a digital system. And every journey in principle uh, could be non-stop, stop, single click and single seat. And if you have the complete network, then it's really uh, connecting multiple origins to multiple destinations. So why faster, greener, better and smarter? Faster, uh, well, because of the zero drag uh, within uh, the low uh, pressure tubes, this is enabling a cruising speed of 700 kilometers per hour, even going up to 1000 kmh. Um, already the, uh, the, the city to city center example came uh, by in the other presentations, uh, a trip of 500 kilometers will take about 40 minutes. The same trip takes by air about three hours if you include access and egress and processing time. Greener, Zero drag enables ultra low energy consumption. Uh, it can be powered by 100% renewables, but even with uh, the energy mix of today, there's a significant amount of energy reduction. So it depends on the benchmark that you take. Um, it's greener, five times greener, up to infinite greener if you use only renewables. Uh, better, it's a tubes, so it's with a very real-like capacity, tram-like convenience, you can hop on and anywhere, and it's faster than a plane. Uh, tube eliminates the external factors, uh, so no more delays because uh, there is snow, wind, it's raining or falling leaves. Uh, so really eliminating external factors and then annoyances. Automation minimizes human errors. And the infrastructure, in principle, could be beside or above existing transport corridors. So that would minimize new intrusions in landscapes. If you want to extend uh, the current highway, it takes immense amounts of land. Or if you want to extend an airport close to the city, same problem. With the Hyperloop, in principle, it can be alongside existing infrastructure. Uh, smarter, I just picked uh, two, 
uh, an important one is the arrival prediction within one second. So that's important both uh, for freight, but also for passengers. Um, the other one I wanted to highlight is, and this is a comparison to railways, no physical bending of tracks is needed. Uh, ju just if you have in your mind how a railway works, if you want to switch from one track to another, the tracks need to physically bend. And of course, uh, it requires a lot of maintenance. It's prone to, to uh, delays, no functioning, et cetera, et cetera. With a Hyperloop, uh, it's easy and you don't have any physical things to do. So this is really enables a high network capacity and allows high speed, even during speed, uh, speed lane switching. Um, and we wanted to have um, um, a better uh, understanding of what the impact could be. We didn't really follow the very methodological approach uh, that Yassar uh, uh, described just now, but we started very simple. We created a simple example network uh, uh, connecting several airports in the western part of Europe. So basically connecting Amsterdam, uh, Charles de Gaulle in Paris, and the airport in Frankfurt and all the airports in between. And that is shown on the left part of the slide. Uh, we also are, uh, are showing uh, the distances uh, between uh, the airports. And in the end, if you connect these airports, they have a core network of about 800 kilometers. Uh, and uh, to really uh, look into the effects and to be able to, to uh, do some calculations, the scenario calculations, we created uh, metro regions, as we call them. And basically, that's uh, connecting all the cities, villages, with a very metro-like infrastructure, in this case, uh, uh, covered by a high-loop infrastructure close to the main airports. So uh, around Amsterdam, we created a kind of structure in uh, uh, orange, uh, the Randstad uh, structure, we, uh, we called it. Uh, in Germany, uh, the Ruhrgebiet uh, became up as a different approach, but it's just illustrative. It could be done in several ways. But if you do this, it results in a total network just in this small part of Europe of about 1,000 kilometers. And it's already connecting more than 28 million people. And they have access to all trips nonstop and on demand. So then now some numbers. Um, in the table, uh, we calculated the trip times if you uh, travel by a hyperloop uh, going between the airports. And everything is well below uh, one uh, of uh, below half an hour, except Paris, Frankfurt. And that's basically because of this lim limited network uh, that we used. Uh, in, in this case, if you want to go from Paris to Frankfurt, you actually have to take a detour through uh, Eindhoven in the Netherlands. So that's the reason why it ended up with 40 minutes. Um, but uh, uh, to pick the same example as three, uh, he already mentioned Hyperloop uh, uh, Paris Amsterdam. Uh, it's in this table as well. That's 28 minutes uh, in our calculations compared to a Thalys. Thalys is three hours, 20 minutes, and a plane simply fly, the flight time is about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes the last time I did it. Uh, and if you add the excess and, and egress, especially uh, flying, then it, it's summing up to two or even three hours because it's a lot of time to get in the plane, uh, taxi in on the runway and get going. The other thing I would like to highlight in this table is um, the, the nearest airport to Schiphol is Eindhoven. And taking a hyper look, that's only 10 minutes. So if it could be a, a new gate for Amsterdam to, to really optimize uh, uh, the, the traffic and the capacity from Schiphol. At this moment, if you go from gate B to gate D at Schiphol, it takes longer than 10 minutes. So you would be uh, sooner in Eindhoven and take the plane over there than switch gates in Eindhoven. So that's an option to, uh, to uh, keep in mind. Uh, then uh, we did some calculations. We uh, simply uh, assumed all the short haul flights between these airports are replaced by hyperloops. What would be uh, the numbers, especially from a climate perspective? 
and then we ended up with uh, already uh, annually uh, CO2 emission reductions of 260 kilotons every year. Um, and uh, we added the other uh, environmental benefits, so as air pollution, uh, uh, costs of 5 million, and uh, avoided uh, noise, and then a very important one, uh, we calculated the total time savings, especially for passengers using the daily available seat kilometers, and uh, of course, uh, the ones, the passengers that are traveling, but we ended up with a time saving of already in one year, 2,704 years. So that's massive. That's a direct impact for everyone traveling. And of course you can monetize it, then it results in 230 million euros. Uh, we took the scenario analysis just one step further. We added uh, the CAPEX numbers, uh, the OPEX numbers, and some uh, pricing scenarios. Uh, and of course, it depends on the benchmark that you choose, but uh, the uh, benefit to cost ratios of the Hyperloop are exceptionally high, uh, really exceeding the ones of the mainstream uh, modes of transport. And uh, the price setting uh, in our calculations, and it was, again, very high level, the sweet spot seems to be a car-like pricing. So a similar pricing as taking a car, then you have the advantages of a Hyperloop, but the same price setting of a car. The, that gives the highest economic benefits, both uh, for, for the, the passengers, uh, but also for the revenues for the companies implementing the Hyperloop and the environmental impacts are the highest. If we would lower the price even further, so a real-like price setting, then we would need to extend uh, the capacity of the Hyperloop, so we didn't do that one. And obviously, it's freeing up runway capacity of airports and roads uh, if it will be implemented additional to the existing modes of transport. Then uh, the final slides, uh, concluding uh, remarks or additional impacts. I already mentioned it's creating capacity at air hubs uh, simply by replacing short haul flights, but also giving the option to optimize the capacity of different airports. Um, if uh, you do it right, uh, this is a way to avoid the investment in an extra runway of one of the busiest air, uh, airports. And well, in the end, simply avoiding uh, the investment in an additional runway in Heathrow will buy already 600 kilometers of Hyperloop. Uh, the uh, uh, infrastructure I showed on two slides ago was about 1,000 kilometers. Massively increasing logistics efficiency because it's on demand, it's high speed, uh, so it makes sense to create the super hubs. Uh, replacing 10 local hubs and still being able to deliver everything across the continent within one day. Then you still need some uh, distribution uh, centers uh, in, the, in the cities for the last mile, but this is already uh, far more efficient than the existing uh, solutions. Um, the increased city workforce reached to 250 kilometers. And the assumption we took in this case was that uh, someone would be willing to travel or commute every day for one hour, and that amounts to about 50 kilometers uh, from a work. And then you can do the calculations, and uh, then you end up with in an increasing area from which businesses can attract talent without moving residents by 25 times. And this, of course, is the unlocker of elevating the housing scarcity and soaring housing prices. You can live literally at least in the Netherlands, everywhere where you want, close to the family, close to the nature. You don't have to live in the inner cities anymore. And the Hyperloop, in a principle, it can be from city centre to city centre, so drastically reducing the first and the last mile time. Well, thank you. I hope I stick to my time. So it's back to you. No, that was great. Thank you so much, Lucienne. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists for their great presentations. Um, I'm just going to jump right in because we have some great audience questions I want to make sure we get to. Um, but we have a couple of opening questions first, so I'll just jump in and start with those. Uh, Yasha, sure, I'm going to start with you. Um, I, I see the 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 formula, not a formula, but the format that you created to study the impact of um, different types of disruptive technologies. I'm curious if you 
have applied that to anything outside of our modern times, or if you think that disruption is um, a creation of essentially the world that we currently live in versus traditional innovation? Um, or do you think there's examples from history of, of really disruptive innovations that we can look to? Um, to be honest, I haven't looked at the uh, historic, I haven't tested our framework with historical examples, but of course, uh, to the second part of your question, uh, uh, disruptive innovation is not part of our uh, modern um, uh, uh, modern times. It's been there in the past. Uh, for example, um, the uh, basically even starting with really past uh, printing, offset printing was a, a disruptive innovation, how people shared knowledge. Uh, books was for only for the uh, top uh, rich part, the part of the population, whereas when the uh, mass printing came, everybody was able to access newspapers or read uh, uh, more information. Uh, moving on, we can even call the new way of manufacturing vehicles by Ford was a disruptive innovation in terms of uh, in, in terms of uh, being mobile. So uh, again, he made uh, the, the car available for mass population. And um, the, so you can just name a few, a few, I mean, even the steamboats were disruptive innovations uh, to normal sailing boats. When they, uh, when, they, when they arrived, basically the sailing boats were so expensive and the, the, the movement of the products and goods were, uh, across the world became cheaper with the steel, uh, steamboats or ships. So there have been a lot of examples in the past, uh, disruptive examples, but in the recent times with the accelerated technology, these disruptions ha happen more often than in the past. Absolutely, great, thank you. Those are those are fun mobility examples as well. So <laughs> thanks for keeping with the theme. Um, uh, Shri, I, I think uh, the presentation you gave on Social XR is such an interesting concept because it mixes the idea or the concept of mobility in innovation without actually requiring mobility um, to make it work, which is which is somewhat uh, curious uh, in terms of these discussions. Um, are there other disruptive technologies that you can think of that have such an intense or could have a potentially intense impact on the mobility sector, but are not themselves mobility technologies? Yeah, thanks very much for the question, Summer. Um, well, it is a valid question. It is indeed a new perspective of looking into, well, why do we travel? So going, reasoning one step um, um, further um, um, to find out what's the actual necessity to travel. And if that necessity is fulfilled, then would you still travel? Um, we can look at that in various ways. Uh, the, the entire virtual world uh, opens opens up uh, the opportunities quite a lot. And one of the examples is indeed the internet reality. But you could say the same for a concept called avatars. It is a bit far-fetched to be presenting it in this conference, um, um, and therefore <laughs> I did not choose to say it as an example. However, I can say uh, briefly say what it is. Um, avatars basically functions on a, um, uh, it is a mix of extended reality with uh, uh, the ability to control a robot which is far away. So any action that you do, is equal to the action that a robot does somewhere far away in the world. So with that uh, integrated with a bit of, uh, uh, how do you say, the heat sensors to give uh, uh, you know, the experience of the environment, but also the sense of smell, uh, for instance, uh, but most importantly, the, the tactile aspect. So if somebody touches the robot, how does it feel if somebody touches me as a person? And that is also part of a research project where uh, TNO is working on. Uh, you could simply search for it as Express Authors and uh, uh, as into iBotics, and that's basically the name of our team. A brilliant group of, I think, 25 uh, intelligent scientists working on this and actually competing on an organization uh, on, on, on an international level uh, to win the competition because the winner gets about $5 million. So we are, uh, we are really taking this seriously <laughs> wow that is that is really fascinating um what, uh, <laughs> an amazing concept thank you Sri. uh lucien i want to talk a little bit about the hyperloop um which 
has been a topic of discussion, I think, in the mobility world, at least for a decade, and the technology uh, came before it. It just sort of formed into the Hyperloop in, in 2013. Um, I think one of the one of the questions that still pops out for me and, and sort of popped up a bit in the chat too is that there's still going to be an immense amount of new infrastructure needed for the Hyperloop to, to function, even at a small scale, as you've mentioned. Um, and as well as, as at least some level of education or marketing or promotion to socialize the concept with folks that are used to driving or used to taking flights uh, to places that they want to go. Um, so can you talk just a little bit about, and, and using the Hyperloop as an example, how major disruptive technologies like this do or could get funded um, and how the public agencies that are involved with them can sort of ensure that that funding is sustainable uh, and, and, and creating those outcomes? Oh, wow, a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> Probably everyone is looking for the answer. Uh, <laughs> there's not a one fits all answer. Uh, but let me try to, to answer it uh, from a point of view uh, that you normally take from the investments. Um, and what you do, you assess the risks, um, you assess the de-risking strategy, the business case, the team, and the upsides uh, during time. And in case of disruptive technologies, uh, that's, that's tough uh, because, well, it's disruptive, it's new, it's innovative, it has never been done. And so it's paramount to have a very concise uh, de-risking strategy, uh, show that technology is working at scale, it's safe, it stays within the cost limits, uh, the standards work and everyone is using the same standards, etc., etc., etc. So uh, um, what you do with the Hyperloop as an example, uh, several companies are developing components or even the complete uh, system. It will be tested at real scale. Uh, I, uh, by mistake, I already mentioned hard Hyperloop. Today, they are opening a test center in Groningen to already test it on real scale, uh, high speed switching. So that, that that's a major uh, de-risking step. Then the next one, this is unlocking uh, a, a cargo loop that you can show that cargo is possible, that it's safe, and that's in unlocking uh, a passenger route. So it's really the de-risking strategy that needs to be in place to build up the trust uh, and also unlock the investments. And it's always an investment for both from public and private uh, side because, well, probably none uh, will be uh, capital uh, lying around throwing at a hyperloop to invest in. So it will be a mutual approach. Uh, the second part of your question, uh, how to make sure um, investments are sustainable. Uh, that, 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 I think that's a good question for the audience, actually. <laughs> uh, but uh, just to give a, a, a quick answer, um, well, there are ways, of course, that to already uh, make it a criteria in the assessment, in, in the tender process. And if it's as important as the cost uh, criterion, that's a major step forward. Yeah, no, thank you. I think uh, especially during the last year, we've seen a lot of um, the newer technologies sort of fluctuate in their business models. And so I think there's been an increasing attention paid to how to ensure things are sustainable as we're launching them in cities around the world. So um, the, the multiple tiered testing makes a lot of sense um, and, and de-risking. So thank you. Um, I'm going to move into some of our audience questions just to make sure that we get uh, everyone at least one or two. Um, so, Yasher, we have a question from the audience that says, going by the transition theory, how does the disruptive innovation framework consider the influence of top-down global landscapes as well as bottom-up niches to disturb the incumbent regimes? Yeah, well, Great question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that uh, I, I would like to, the, the person who asked this question to explain to me what what uh, they meant by uh, top down. Uh, uh, but um, uh, do you have any ideas, sir? I'm not sure. It was Trisha who asked the question. If they want to type in the chat, I'm happy to to read it all for us. But normally, what I can uh, already react to this question is that top down uh, policy. There are some innovations that are. Um, supported from the uh, from the governments from the uh, authorities and they are normally policy motivated innovations and uh but we have shirisa shirisha um, there we go. Uh, 
Great. Please elaborate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, from top down, I mean, I mean, the global landscape is nothing but the uh, bigger picture of, of of the innovation, like the climate change, the the mm -hmm. um, uh, like extended reality, the te technological innovation. So those are the uh, bigger picture of the smaller innovations that that come into daily life. So. Um, mm -hmm. That is one part, and the bottom niches are. Uh, if you take a uh, urban mobility example, so the bottom niches is nothing but the um, suppose in, suppose you consider auto mobility as an incumbent regime, then the bottom thing but the uh, e scooters, uh, shared mobility, mm -hmm. and, and 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 things like that. So how how does these two uh, play uh, uh, its role, their role in 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 order to shape the disruptive innovation? So that that's what my question was. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for elaborating. Uh, very helpful. Well, um, I think uh, I was going on the right path. Um, so basically, the, the niches uh, uh, need to follow more or less the footsteps that Christiansen lays, that they need to see where the market demand lies and try to uh, find uh, opportunities, windows of opportunities, how to sell their products or innovations to the market. So they have to be affordable, easy to use, have the basic features in, in place, and they will find ways to 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 um, uh, to uh, for their ways in the market. Um, that's what I also see in, uh, in let's say uh, light electric vehicles that have come to the market. What we see a, a new modes, alternative modes that we see in our heavily urban areas. Um, a few, a lot of them fail, of course, and a few of them survive. Uh, but the ones that survive always take uh, incumbents uh, by uh, by uh, surprise, and the incumbents normally have to either buy in or basically offer the same products and features. But a few innovations need to be supported, uh, especially when we're talking about sustainability, environmental pollution limits. Um, some of the innovations don't make economical sense in first place. I can even uh, dare to say Hyperloop. Uh, they don't make economic sense for a company to, you know, jump in there and say, I'm going to make this broad. Um, they need a lot of uh, cash investment from governments for a variety of reasons that uh, Lucien just mentioned. Um, it will lift pressure from the job market, from the housing. It will lift pressure on the environment. It will contribute uh, to less pollution. So these are huge societal goals that the governments would like to achieve and invest on uh, and, and, and promote a, a disruptive innovation. Um, so that's that's the different perspectives I would uh, take for your question. Great. Thank you, Yasher. Uh, Sri, we have a question from Peter in the audience. It says, you can virtually fool your eyes or brain with vision. Um, in the future, do you anticipate that uh, XR can fool the feeling of touch in the brain, uh, tactile as well, like, for example, a handshake? Uh, great question. Um, I, I, honestly, I did not expect that question, but it is possible indeed. Um, uh, we do already have uh, vibrating gloves, uh, tactile gloves, um, as well as um, um, what you call it as uh, sensor stickers. So there are stickers that you can put on your skin and that provides a sense of vibration as if somebody is actually uh, in contact with you. So um, these are a bit behind in terms of development when we look into, when we compare that to the developments of extended reality, for example. But for sure, um, it is one of the vital steps uh, to give the element of touch to something which is, which is virtual. And that will be also a very important step. However, um, probably I'm looking then in the scenario or in the horizon of 2050 or 2060, not before that. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, Lucien, we have quite a few questions on Hyperloop. I'm going to try and combine some of them um, so that if we can we can try and get through. Um, one of the things that actually uh, came to mind, comes to mind for me when I think about the Hyperloop in particular is, is sort of that natural interplay in my mind between transportation and land use that it presents, but also in a lot of different contexts, as some of the questions have highlighted. 
um, the trade-off discussion that has to happen, right? So for example, uh, in one of your slides, you talk about allowing folks to live farther away because then they can have more affordable housing and, and expand the work shed, which is great. But um, at least in the American context, that can also induce sprawl, uh, which creates, um, because it's cheaper to build out farther than, than dense cities, um, and that can create more carbon emissions and, and more uh, strain on our uh, environment. So uh, we had a question about the, the amount of embodied carbon involved in developing the Hyperloop infrastructure and whether that is equivalent or lower than infrastructure for rail or for vehicles. And so I just want to talk a little bit about how those trade-off discussions are had um, and who's involved in making those decisions. Is it uh, public-private partnerships? Is it um, engagement with stakeholders or is it done at the corporate level or at the company level at the investor level to try and meet a set of goals? How, how do you go about those trade-offs in, in such a big disruptive concept as Hyperloop? <laughs> Oh, uh, okay, yeah, there are uh, more than one question in, in this this one question. Um, uh, yeah, in the end, it's a systemic uh, solution. And we are focusing on the Hyperloop and investment in Hyperloop. Um, so we see uh, the, the impacts that it could have on, on the housing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In the end, um, what we will try to do, uh, and not uh, us uh, uh, as you know, energy, but everyone involved in it, um, to make everyone aware of the possibilities uh, of a Hyperloop. Uh, because then uh, urban planners can take it into account and use it and, and make the right decision, uh, go for urban sprawl or actually denser cities or not a solution. If you are aware of what's possible, you can work with it. If you're not aware, uh, well, then, it, then it's difficult. Uh, so uh, uh, local governments, urban planners, those kind of stakeholders need uh, to know uh, about the possibilities and that it's possible already in the near future. Um, the other question was about embodied um, carbon and all uh, that stuff. It really depends a lot on the infrastructure that you will implement in the end. Uh, are the tubes from steel or are they from concrete? So there are still several decisions to be taken to come up with uh, more reliable numbers. So we didn't make that uh, comparison yet. Um, how to, 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 to get it implemented? Well, you can't do it alone. Uh, you can't do it as an investor alone. Uh, the companies that, that are developing uh, the components or the hyperloops can't do it alone. So this will be very much a collaborative approach. Within Europe, um, we are working with uh, uh, several member states, Brussels, uh, the, the actually creating the complete value chain uh, to make it happen. And in my opinion, if you really want to uh, disrupt something, Anywhere you need to work with the value chain, otherwise you end up with optimization very locally with every uh, step in it and you end up with nothing. Uh, is that the question, uh, an answer? Yeah, no, that was, that was great. Sorry, I, I threw a lot at you there, but I really love the framing that you created there that, you know, it, it's a collaborative effort and it's a set of new tools that can be utilized by planners, cities, governments, etc. cetera. Um, that, that, that makes a lot of sense, thank you. Um, okay, I have some more audience questions, more questions for me, we're running out of time, so I'll try and get through as many as we can. Um, I guess, Sri, moving back to you, uh, I've seen, you know, as places are opening up, we're starting to see congestion return. Um, flights are filling back up, crowds are becoming a thing again. Um, and, and you talk a little bit in your presentation about a sweet spot for launching this type of disruption, specifically the SXR. Um, can you imagine this rolling out in this, at this period and what that could look like if we were able to, to start this process now, um, both in the, in the social and the professional world? Very valid question. Um, well, I the, the core idea about this technology, um, if, if we look into the market trend, there was a very high demand for such kind of technologies, especially when in, in last year when we were in total lockdown. And then, of course, if there is a demand, then the, it immediately solves an entire uh, chain 
uh, then there has to be a supply which needs to be ready to supply to the demand. However, um, the the supply was not ready. Uh, the technology nobody anticipated that such a kind of technology would be necessary at that point of time. Um, so how we see it as a uh, a warning, a first warning and a first opportunity that well, hey, look at this, guys. Because of the pandemic, there are some lessons learned. Lessons learned in the sense a lot of people are now more digitally literate on how to use digital systems, how to do video video calls, and not only in businesses, but also, for example, my granddad, <laughs> who never used to do uh, uh, video calls, for example. Um, and these things keep changing, and these change uh, in a good direction, in a direction towards where, for example, extreme reality technology can be more useful. And that gives us an extra incentive that although these technologies come a bit late, it does come with a huge impact. And the question is, how do we try to gain the maximum impact out of, those, out of that technology? Because in 2022, what I think is going to happen is that while there's a new version of iPhone released on the market, people could also buy their own um, um, Apple Glass, which supports VR and AR uh, technologies. And when that happens, and when that becomes very commonly available for the entire public, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to say it's just an extra bunch of semiconductors and chips in a very fancy device that maybe represents your status? Or are we actually going to uh, use it to perhaps try and solve some societal questions? And that's the actual question that we're trying to solve here. Hey, thank so, you. Love. Sure you're, not, you're never too late. <laughs> great, great framing. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure, I'm gonna move over to you and just uh, note that in your examples, I didn't see electric vehicles in, in the uh, disruptive technologies and maybe it just wasn't included, but I'm wondering if that was intentional because electric vehicles are not disruptive. Um, yeah. And if not, is it that they don't fall into the categories quite yet of affordable or easy to use perhaps? Um, so just first part of the question, whether that was intentional and whether the, what the thinking behind that is. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, if there's other examples of recent mobility technologies that we may think of as as big, uh, micro mobility was brought up earlier, scooters, for example, that maybe don't fall into the disruptive category by that by that kind of lens. Well, electric vehicles uh, have recently, in a couple of last couple of two three years, have uh, taken off uh, in terms of uh, the number of registrations and how the. Uh, current existing uh, OEMs uh, are looking at them. So a few of them are setting hard deadlines that after 2030, we're going to be so many percentage of our fleets is going to be produced in electricity. Some are even saying that after 2030, all of our fleet will be produced in, um, in electric, uh, with electric engines, uh, no combustion. Uh, but uh, looking at a global number of fleets that we have, it's less than 1% of the uh, car vehicle uh, fleet are electric and the uh, the the current electric manufacturers are not being able to really address the wide uh, uh, spectrum of consumers because the electric vehicles are very expensive compared to, with the with the normal combustion engine cars but i see that uh, in, in china they're taking a few steps to address the uh, global mass of a uh, market uh, with very uh, cost-effective electric vehicles. And the other very important thing with electric vehicles that stops them, according to what we see uh, from Christensen, is their range. I mean, the electric vehicles have been there for a long time, uh, I can say in commercial, at least 10, 20 years, but they had a range of 100, even Tesla had a range of 100, 150 kilometers, compared with the uh, with a, a range of six, six, seven hundred kilometers you get from normal cars. So that is one of the, what Christensen says, that is one of the essential elements of a, an you know, of innovation. It's not there, the, the, it, it weren't there, the essential elements wasn't there for the user. So they would, uh, they like the, uh, let's say, uh, zero emission features, they like the no sound and sometimes even new gadgets in there, but the uh, essential elements are not there. And that's why we think 
um, the two big things are missing first affordability and the other one essential uh, essential characteristics of the product so what you see now uh, happen is with the new technologies that are uh, introduced with the batteries longer life batteries but uh, the, uh, the the current electric vehicle manufacturers are trying to increase the range that is the big uh, how do you say uh, race happening in there who is trying to uh, reach to their current vehicles six seven seven hundred uh, kilometers and with that, you see the uh, numbers have started, number of people buying them has started to rise. People are starting to actually adopt them. Previously, they were there, but uh, the, the number of registration was very low. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and and I realize we are at time, so I, I wanna thank all of our panelists, Lucy and Yashir Sri. Uh, this has been such an informative and interesting conversation. Um, and it looks like Shri put his email in the chat. Uh, and, and if others want to do the same for further questions, I know we didn't get to all of the audience questions. I apologize, but thank you all for being here and uh, for, for interacting with us. Thanks Bye a lot. Nice.